Many people have asked themselves, will artificial intelligence take their job? Will AI rise to such a level where humans are no longer needed? I wondered about that myself approximately a year ago when I started exploring a tool such as ChatGPT. This discussion is very specific to those interested in software development. And in particular, I'm looking at software development. And so over the course of humanity's existence, there have been many within humanity that have wondered about the ability to have a thought and create something from a thought. There have been many that said, what if there was a way to create an exceptional work of art, beautiful, majestic, in an effortless way? There have been others that said, you know, it would be really nice to create state-of-the-art technology, buildings, cars, even computers, using only the inferences from the back of a napkin. And there are also those that wondered about the ability to use a brain interface, such as Neuralink, or many of the brain interfaces that you can buy today on Amazon.com. On Amazon.com, there are these brain headbands that you could buy. They have been around in many varieties for more than just a year or two. I've seen them as far back as, I would say, eight years ago, maybe even further back. And so these brain interfaces, these headbands, they allow you to do a couple of things. Depending on the model, the headband would allow you to create, to control a video game, to check your biological rhythms. There has even been video games developed at one point that was what you would call spiritual video games that allowed you to wear this headband and because it's monitoring your brain waves in a certain way, it helps you to meditate. It helps you to align the way you breathe. And very fascinating concepts. Personally, I've never explored these devices. I've found them to be cost prohibitive, anywhere from 200 to $400 or more. And so they exist and they have gotten better over time from what I hear. I've seen demonstrations of them by a individual by the name of Seven Bomar, whose social media account goes by the name of Inner Standing, and you can find him on the website, uh, secretenergy.com. He demoed this brain interface and how to actually control your brain waves. It was pretty amazing. But beyond that, people have wondered in financial services, in hospitality and healthcare, and not to mention customer service, will the AI that we see today come forth and do a much better job than the human beings? And so those questions are yet to be answered. There are companies that are out there, they are trying these things out. They are going forward with the reduction in staff, in payroll, people are getting laid off. People are actually being um, removed from their positions because there are companies out there, whether they are third party consultants or they are uh, projects that occur within the companies themselves to take things that can be automated or things that are very procedural by the book and that have repetitive patterns that are legitimate for the business and that can be encoded in an artificial intelligence. So this is a reality today. This is not something that is happening years from now. So the question again for software developers is will AI replace software developers? So as I explore this concept, I would like to bring attention to an individual by the name of Dom Ashburn. Dom Ashburn, also known in social media circles as Mr. Grateful, was featured on the 
uh, social media platform, high level conversations, executive produced by 19 Keys. And 19 Keys interviewed Dom Ashburn or Mr. Grateful on his views about artificial intelligence, the future of technology and how this impacts humanity. Let's see what Mr. Ashburn had to say on this topic. I don't know about you, but I found Mr. Ashburn or Mr. Grateful to be very well spoken, eloquent. I found him to be exceptionally positive, and I found his intellect, his mind, to be quite well developed and inspiring. And so when I watched that episode of High Level Conversations many months ago, I was quite impressed with what Mr. Ashburn or Mr. Grateful had to present. I think he did a really great job. I think you'll agree. Reflecting on your sleep, on your cycle, on um, your activity level, on the amount of food that you're eating, you know what I'm saying? All, all of that. So you have these three different AIs, but you know, they're together. It's a hybrid AI. Mm -hmm. So I think people are gonna start seeing more of an individual personalized AI experience mm -hmm. rather than this like omnipotent thing. In GTA 6, having NPCs that are trained as an AI it's going to open the door for that and make people a bit more, it's going to be the Trojan horse that's going to allow people to, to accept um, personal AIs, um, you know, in, in, this, in this new era that we're entering into. I agree with that. That goes back to the chat GPT bots. Like I said, we have a, a high level AI. It's trained on everything high level. We have a 19 key AI. It's trained on everything 19 keys. When I say train on everything, 19 keys mean I literally sit down there and ask me questions. I answer the questions. I have writings of mine that only I have access to. So instead of just writing a book, right, what I'm doing is I'm taking all of those transcripts and I'm uploading into an AI. And so it's like I'm giving you a living book, right? You can ask this book questions. You can read this book, right? I can upload it in chapters and you can say, hey, what's the first chapter? What's the first page? You can go page by page with it if you want to. Or you can ask it to customize the book in a, in a way where talk to me like 19 keys will give me advice because it's trained on a certain knowledge set and it's only the knowledge that I give it. Now I can decide to say AI, you can have the ability to cross reference and search the internet. I thought that was a great conversation between 19 keys and Mr. Grateful. And I think Mr. Grateful did a great job of showing the positive side of artificial intelligence. It is a three hour interview and it's very captivating. 19 Keys is a very captivating speaker and Mr. Grateful is a very captivating presenter. And the two of them together held the audience's attention in my view quite well through all the different nuances of artificial intelligence in terms of its positive impact, what the opportunities are, and so on. Now. I enjoyed it and I would say I enjoyed it more on an entertainment basis and a philosophical basis rather than a call to action, so to speak. But I think it's worth noting what they said in that discussion and I would encourage anyone to look at high level conversations with Mr. Grateful and 19 Keys. I bring up Mr. Grateful for the reason that a relative of mine who I speak with often, they are into artificial intelligence as an end user. And they see different themes publicized on social media that discuss, disclose, and represent some of the opportunities one has with artificial intelligence, such as the ability to build a business, to build a company, to streamline business operations to build websites and so because of my technological background having worked in IT in the past for over 20 years primarily in the capacity of software development business analysis and business automation 
they look at my advice to see if these claims that people make on social media about AI, about what it can do to help you build income, um, if it's worthwhile or if there's some legitimacy. Most of the time I have to, um, let's say, uh, shed some reality on these claims and because when you think about what many people represent on social media, oftentimes the claims may be exaggerated and they can be gateways into someone selling a course or selling some type of consultancy, you know, a consultation. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it may not deliver or lead to the type of results in terms of what some would call passive income that many would um, desire. So even with all of that, every once in a while, there are some gold nuggets. There's something that exists in this sea of people attempting to find um, a better way to exist through technology. And it was one of the things that were brought to my attention was a two hour interview with Mr. Grateful and um, a guy named Mr. Callum. And so what I liked about this particular discussion was that it still had the positive and uplifting flavor that I saw in high level conversations with 19 keys, but there was an actual explanation about some of the techniques and some of the ways that you could use in this case in particular chat GPT to actually improve the way that you use AI to create a more effective way of streamlining information of building a brand of building a business and engaging people in social media and in other avenues so as I watch Mr. Grateful go through this breakdown, I started writing notes, I started making notes, and I said, I use ChatGPT every once in a while. Sometimes I use it uh, more, more in some months I use it uh, more in some months than I do in others. But um, when I saw this breakdown about how you can make your own artificial intelligence, I thought it was pretty profound information that then it's going to need to then take care of these services and and do the steps that it needs right so um you wouldn't tell your employee hey go go you, you wouldn't hire somebody that knows nothing about your business and then tell them to go do a task <laughs> yeah you need to give it some information about you and people overcomplicate that process open up the ai start using it and asking it the questions that you have that you would ask the best expert in that field ask it that question ask it the steps it needs to get there if you come to a point ask it what information you need from me in order to do your job properly it'll ask you those questions fill it out give those answers to the ai and then have it do the rest of that work for you it's an iterative process i talk about circular relationship with ai where this is you this is the ai you're going around and around you're giving it a piece of information and then it's going to give you a response. Based on the response, you give it some information, and it's a flywheel. It should go back and forth. Everything in the universe works that way, just like a back and forth, in and out, circular process. Give it the information, get a response, and, and go back and forth with it. It's much simpler than people like actually make it out to be. And soon, AI will just be invisible and intuitive to the point where uh, – you can give it a task and it will have the agency to go and act on these things for you. Um, that's when we get to like AGI and super intelligence and things like that. It'll just start taking the action. Mm. You know, that's, that's, that's the, that's the process. Mm. Yeah. Okay. No, that's so good. And that's so detailed as well. I'm glad you did that. Okay. Um, I hope people were like taking notes. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> they're probably like the video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there that memory component to it or is it almost like, at the start of each day when you make the new content idea, you're kind of like refreshing its memory. Back in the day, when I was, back in the day, this was last year. <laughs> Seems like time's moving so fast now, right? That is only a short snippet out of a two hour discussion where Mr. Grateful does a really good job of going into detail 
well, not so much detail, detail, but a good overview of the steps and the process that you need to take in order to create your own artificial intelligence assistant. So I decided that there was an opportunity here for me in particular with software development that also sheds light on where AI is going in terms of software development and the reality of AI replacing software developers and indeed IT professionals. And so what I did was I said, okay, let me set aside a few hours or maybe a few days to see what I can do with this artificial intelligence concept. And what I did was I went through a process where I first worked with ChatGPT on its own basis to understand what is the process for training and building my own artificial intelligence or what you would call an AI assistant or what OpenAI calls a custom GPT. And in this process, I wanted to ensure that I built a, an assistant that would be maximally useful to me and one that I could get really great results given the potential of artificial intelligence. So what that meant was that there's a certain programming language that I use in my personal projects. I don't use it professionally, but I use it in my personal projects. And in my personal projects, I would very much like the ability to accelerate my software development practice. And it goes without saying that in some cases, when you have executed a certain process more than a hundred times, more than 200 times, maybe approaching a thousand times, you have executed a, pro a process then at some point you may want to streamline that process and that is to say that the level of learning the level of feedback that you get from doing a certain process that you've done hundreds of times before starts to diminish you enter the realm of diminishing returns and so what i wanted to do was take many of the processes that I've grown accustomed to and I wanted to calibrate the ChatGPT system to the processes that I use and the way that I use it. There are several benefits to this. First, when you use ChatGPT normally and you ask it to either write code on your behalf or you ask it to evaluate code that you have written or you ask it to help walk you through a certain software development process so that you could benefit from a more expert scope. Oftentimes, if you've done this many times in the past as have I, you would, you would, you would become disappointed by the results. And the reason is, in short, is that ChatGPT is a instance of an artificial intelligence model, a large language model that sources its information from the wider internet. And in so doing, it's more likely to bring into the context and bring into the situation of the conversation information and knowledge that is that has not been vetted well, that has not been curated, and it may be correct in some contexts, but when translated into your context, it does not have the ability to reason in such a way where it can make general information relevant to your specific situation at a high level of quality, at a high, le at a high level of reliability and robustness. So, in short, the quality suffers when you use a generic and broad database on 
a very specific situation. Now, in some cases, that doesn't matter. If you're trying to get a recipe on how to bake a certain good or cook a certain item, then the bar may not be very high. But when you are writing software and you need the code to match your experience level or even exceed it, if that is even possible, then in many cases, ChatGPT is inadequate for what we would call senior engineers and senior software developers. It's inadequate for architects in the real world. And even in side projects, personal projects, those standards of reliability, of quality, and of a greater, greater depth of functionality, security, and detail still exist. When you build software that is serious, basically you don't want to waste your time. And so for many, the use of GitHub Copilot or ChatGPT General or even Claude, even Claude Sonnet, and a variety of large language models that are built on the corpus of the general internet oftentimes fail to satisfy the requirements that people have in their software projects. Again, the AI is very useful to junior developers and for those that lack subject matter expertise in a certain domain of software development that may need a type of scaffold to get them to a level where they're now able to, or by necessity, have to depart from what large language models like ChatGPT have to offer. But I wanted to reverse that, at least for me, for myself personally. And I say that because what I have created, I'm not quite yet ready to produce for others because I have to make sure that it truly meets the quality uh, specifications that I have in mind. But I want to share with you some things that I have done that uh, bring software development using AI in the right direction. You can begin this process of building a AI assistant by having a discussion with the AI assistant in progress. So you start an AI assistant project in ChatGPT and you start having a dialogue. And this dialogue is going to pull information from the wider internet, but you are attempting to narrow the focus. You're attempting to narrow the focus of this particular AI assistant. And there are many such AI assistants in the OpenAI website, uh, in the GPT store, as it were. And so all of them, what they have in common is they are a more narrow and specific version of the general chat GPT customized with the data that you provide it. And so that's what's happening here is a very general conversation about C++. And my goal is to have this AI assistant operate on the basis of C++ under very specific conditions and constraints. When you read the help documentation on OpenAI's website about creating custom GPTs and AI assistants, it generally encourages you to avoid telling the custom GPT what not to do. I decided to forego that advice because I'm operating from more general design principles. And part of a good design is not just what that design does and what that design enables you to do, but really good designs also have constraints. They have conditions on what you should not do. 
in this case, I want this C++ development assistant to narrowly focus on C++ 17. The reason I want it to focus on C++ 17 is because at this moment, this point in time, August 2024, C++ 17 is the most stable draft standard of C++ that is available. Newer draft standards of C++ are available. C++ 20 and C++ 23 is in progress. However, the compiler that I use, which is the GNU compiler collection, and to a lesser extent, Clang, but let's focus on GNU uh, compiler collection, GCC, and the most stable implementation of C++ is of the newer C++ standards since C++ 11 is C++ 17. So, in order for this assistant to best assist me or support what I'm doing, I want it aligned and calibrated to the draft standard of C++ that I most commonly use. And I don't want it incorporating older versions of C++ and newer versions of C++ that would complicate matters in terms of having to correct, modify, and fix any of those types of suggestions or suggestions based on those earlier or later versions of C++, which the older versions are fine, okay, but I want to use the newest, best version of C++ available, right, and not really use older approaches and techniques that may not be relevant to the way that I'm attempting to write C++ or streamline it in this case. I also don't want newer versions of C++ that may have errors or bugs or flawed um, semantics and effects when I take C++ code and tr attempt to translate it and run it in the real world. So I have provided some of my initial constraints and you saw the little circle that said updating GPT and that was the system actually incorporating that philosophy, that directive into the makeup of this particular AI assistant. So I like to write out my constraints in long form and then GPT at this stage is refined enough to convert a elaborate, highly extemporaneous instruction set into a much more concise and compact uh, set of principles. So if you're doing this sort of process, I wouldn't go to um, a great extents to try to make a concise a uh, very uh, precise uh, set of directives, set of guidelines. But I would write it out long form, write it out the way that you feel most comfortable. And the system is going to be um, capable enough to translate the actual meaning of what you have declared and what you have set up in order to... Um, uh, set the parameters, set the instructions, set the conditions for the AI assistant. So I'm continuing to put more parameters here. And so we have the, the draft version of C++ that we want to use. And I also want this C++ assistant to be aware of and um, I know how that word sounds. It's not actually aware, but 
I want it. To, I want there to be um, a sense of a type of style and a type of um, perspective, or I want a certain perspective in how code is generated through this process through this assistant. I don't want it to write brutally, brutally practical code. And I don't want it to write elaborate, highly refined, exceptionally, extraordinarily, highly abstract code. I don't want either of those extremes. I'm, I would rather something in the middle. Because in the middle is where you get great practicality, productivity, and you're able to align your own proficiency with that which is generated. You generate code that is too far below your proficiency, then you're working against the system to try to take the result and bring it up to your level of preference and sense of how things should be constructed, organized, and defined. And that is one of the issues with ChatGPT in general when you're using the version of ChatGPT that is predominantly sourced from the internet. But on the other extreme, where you have highly abstract code, you're going to a, a much more functional direction. Then you are creating code that looks nice and it's beautiful, but it's code that may not be easily discernible Later on, you know, as the months and years go by and you go back and you look at it, you, you may have to go back and revisit some things conceptually in order to decipher uh, such code. So code that has the right balance between super elegant and uh, somewhat conventional, you may say, is going to be code that is more maintainable. And more importantly than that, sustainable. And so that's the type of code I think is more long-lived than that which is on either extreme. And so that is essentially the parameter that I'm setting here, right? But you can't state it in such clear terms as I want code that is a balance between, you know, um, very elegant and very practical, but be in the middle. It does not have a sense of that. And the sense of that can vary based on the corpus of information that's on the internet. Right? So you have to define what that is. And that's what I'm defining here is a, is a segment of a code style, of a overall code style, where you're going to use the, um, the STL, right? The template library. You are not trying to create recursive template metaprogramming. You're not trying to do any of those types of things. You're trying to write code that is not necessarily systems code because this is a C++ assistant that's more focused on application development, more so than back-end systems development or um microprocessor and microcontroller development. And so that's what I'm setting up here is that range in which it would uh, be able to operate and um, produce code that requires minimal rework in terms of code that's generated by this process. So it has taken that and this is my, my test of this process, right? Um, can you describe how to build a desktop Linux application? This is the C++ Development Assistant. Normally, up in the upper left, you, you're, you're used to seeing uh, model 4.40 or 4 or 3.5 or whatever. But here, it's using the C++ Development Assistant. And it's actually going through and... It's responding in the way that 
I had designated to respond. And when I reached this point, I couldn't be more pleased. But keep in mind, this is not the end. This is not the end of the this is not the end of the story. And actually it's not the beginning of the story. More so, this is kind of what you could expect when you have put all the pieces together and the chat discussion to configure this C++ development assistant was the tail end of the process. What is yet to be shown is the front end of the process, how we got to the point where we have a high-quality response based on a database of knowledge that was plugged into this C++ development assistant, this custom GPT that I have calibrated for this purpose. And there are many pieces that go along with that that we will we will discuss in short order. But when I went through this process, I wanted to double check each step and not make any assumptions about what was done. And you'll notice two tabs up there, create and configure. And based on the earlier conversation, you will see that um, there are instructions, there's knowledge, and I think at this point when I toggled to the configure tab, even though I hadn't changed anything, um, it said update pending. But anyway, um, once I uh, confirm the update, there is the uh, ready to go C++ development assistant. As I said, over several days, I set upon the task of building a custom GPT. And one of the things that I had to do was I had to build a knowledge base that this custom GPT would be able to use in order to reflect my requirements for software development. And that was not really an arduous task in that if you're like many senior developers and senior engineers and people senior in their work, they have a history and a automatic habit of accumulating information. So this was not a new process for me, this part of it. But what was new for me was curating the information in a way that would be relevant for an artificial intelligence. And so the summary is that the custom GPT requires that you have a knowledge base in the form of documents. They could be PDFs, they could be XML files, text files, any file that is readable that the OpenAI ChatGPT system is able to read. And so there are a maximum of 20 files that you can provide in a knowledge base and the, the maximum file size is half a gigabyte. So if you were to achieve those maximum limits, then you could, you could, you could provide a custom GPT approximately 10 gigabytes worth of information. Now, in reality, the file upload processes in the web interface to ChatGPT will not allow you to even approach those limits or even a fraction of those limits. But you can provide substantial enough information to a custom GPT that it would have a very good knowledge base upon which to provide more relevant, more specific, and more effective answers to your queries. And so that's what I did. And so I worked over several days and I put the corpus of information together and I'm going to walk you through what this actually looks like so that you can see what building a custom GPT assistant for software development looks like in general and it gives a window into what these AIs look like that different companies are selling such as 
AIs that build websites and AIs that do customer service and AIs that do sales and AIs that do this and that. The process that you will see here is a blueprint for how that process unfolds. Going more deeply, it helps to look at the process of actually building the knowledge base that trains the AI. And so over several days, I gathered a variety of documents that describe aspects of the overall C++ development process in Linux. These are documents I've read over many years and I retrieved the latest versions of these documents. One of the things is that, or one of the realities of C++ even in 2024 is you still have to integrate with C code. And so I wanted to make sure that was part of the knowledge base, but not just any standard of C, but the latest standard of C or the latest production ready version of C C17. And I also wanted the AI assistant to understand C++ as a standard. By the way, during my discussions with ChatGPT prior to this, we had developed a code standard and a style guide. And I took the entire conversation that I had with ChatGPT and I committed it to a PDF document. My attempt to do that through GP, chat GPT itself was unsuccessful. It was unable to uh, take the entire conversation in the web browser and generate a PDF. It had lost context by the end of the conversation, which was fine. But I knew that using the very conversation itself would be a way of reinforcing reinforcing the the AI and that's what I did I also took select articles that I had written on C++ just three um, my review of the book advanced and C C++ compiling so that it would have an idea of my uh, insights as well as a review of from mathematics to generic programming and optimize C++ uh, code. And so when you gather these documents, you can upload the data to your AI assistant, to the AI assistant. And in my first attempt at doing this, there were a number of failures. The failures had to do with the size of the documents themselves. Indeed, the, the file can be up to 512 megabytes, which is quite generous, but you can only upload at most 20 files, and I um, had more than 20 files. Now, I will say that using the web-based uh, interface, I did not find uh, it possible to upload a file larger than, to successfully upload a file larger than, um, 15 megabytes, anywhere from 12 to 15 megabytes. So, but that was fine. But in theory, if you were able to accommodate 512 megabyte uh, files, then you would have uh, an overall uh, database size of about 10 gigabytes when you have a maximum of 20 files in this case. So I said, okay, um, this and it took many hours before I got to this point where I was like, yes, my, my issue is um, the file. Because the error messages that I had received through the website was very generic. It didn't pinpoint or tell you exactly why it rejected your file. So you were left to guess. But eventually I had guessed correctly that it was the, the, file, the file size. It was the amount of files. And I said, okay, how do I work around this? And one of the ways you can work around this, in particular with PDFs, is that you can merge PDFs together. Text files, 
you can use the cat command in Linux to unite files together. So prior to all of that, I was going to create approximately 10 custom GPTs and have like the, my little micro swarm of C++ GPTs that would work in concert. But by the time I got to like the fourth or fifth uh, GPT, the system just kept rejecting everything that I would attempt to do. And I can't pinpoint it exactly, but I think that when you run into limitations, it, it applies across GPTs. So it's not, um, it's not 10 gigabytes per uh, AI assistant. It's across all AI assistants. That's my interpretation, and it could be incorrect. But you can have 20 files per GPT, but across all GPTs that you create, you, you have a maximum uh, file load that the system would allow you to uh, sustain. So, and then, you know, I had, I had some worrying concerns that GPTs could disappear, GPTs could get deleted. There's all kinds of things that can happen with this service on OpenAI servers. I have seen OpenAI um, instances when I used OpenAI's ChatGPT, I've seen it crash out on me. I've seen it run into problems. Right. It's not all roses, you know, so make no mistake about that. There is not all roses, but to the extent that you can use the service, it um, it is useful when you are able to use it correctly and you're able to get quality results. But here's the thing. When I ran into file limitations, what what ended up happening is the system blocked me from uploading any new files for about two hours. And within those two hours, I went back to the drawing board. And this is what I came up with, is approximately 11 files that were these, the common combination of, let's say approximately 50 files. So let's say I took 50 files and I merged them all into approximately 11 files. And so, mission accomplished, yes. Um, and during that time, I ended up tagging some of the files. I put metadata metadata that explain uh, some of the files, some of the sections. Because when you have this big, long document, right, that is really multiple documents, it can be somewhat incoherent. And I wanted the, uh, the GPT engine when it interpret it, interprets the file, uh, these massive files that I put together, to interpret them um, as it encounters different sections of, of, of a amalgamated document to know what it's about to encounter so it can uh, better qualify the context of that information that it's about to, um, to, to encounter. So, so that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you're using ChatGPT is that there are limits. There is quite a bit involved in building a GPT, a custom GPT that you would be able to use for software development. And while we're at it, let's recap this process and see what this looks like. Earlier, I mentioned that there were approximately 50 files. I went back and I did a count, and the amount of files that I had accumulated and that I had that I wanted to train the AI on was 168 files. So when the maximum number of files that you can upload is 20, 168 files is not going to cut it. I just wanted to point out that Talking to ChatGPT about how to create a custom GPT is good, and it's good information. But if you really want to know, the best uh, source to, to consult is the help documentation on OpenAI's website. But it is instructive to formulate a plan for creating a custom GPT by using ChatGPT itself. 
And so these folders all together comprise 168 files. And at the time that I had accumulated this information, I had everything organized and everything set up the way that I want. It, I put a lot of thought into it, and I was so pleased with what I had put together. But unbeknownst to me, that there was just too much inf- I Let's take that back. There wasn't too much information. It was just represented in too many files. And I needed to take all of this information, which I believe every bit of it is relevant, but I needed to consolidate it into fewer files. And fortunately, tools exist to do that. And I have done that before. It's just that I don't have to do it often. But I'm glad the capability exists to take numerous files and combine them together. Again, uh, you want to make sure that the files, when you combine them, they still make sense. And that was one of the things that I had to struggle with was how am I going to organize it? Because I was under a time, uh, a time schedule in that I didn't want to spend months doing this, and I didn't even want to spend a week doing this. I limited myself to two to three days. And so um, I wanted to make sure that this was done um, in a way that I didn't invest too much into it, but I invested just enough to see if this was a feasible direction. So I have various folders here where I progressively reduce down the number of files while maintaining the same amount of information. And um, it um, I won't say it was a Herculean effort, but it was certainly an effort that required um, quite a bit of, of understanding of the files themselves, the contents of the files. And I've read these files over several years, and I've created some of these files. So I was, I was familiar with the information, but it was a matter of putting the information together in a way that made sense. So that's what I set out to do here. And, you know, you just sit and you, you say to yourself, what, what can I do with this? Because if you look at the folder hierarchy here, or I'm sorry, the folder sequence, it seems to flow in a certain pattern, but in reality, some files that are, for example, in C++ build and C++ build auto tools and C++ build Debian, for example, they don't immediately amalgamate or consolidate together. It doesn't make sense to just blindly and, bl- and, and bluntly do that. You, what you want to do is you want to um, tag the files in these folders. And what I mean by that is you have to create a metadata file. And what a metadata file does is it uh, essentially explains the files in that folder. So I did that first, and it took a while to do that. It didn't have to be extensive. And the insight for doing that came from ChatGPT itself. I had asked it a question earlier what is the best file formats for encoding information for AI training? And it responded um, with several file formats, plain text, JSON, XML, PDF, Word documents, and that sort of thing. And I got it to be more specific. And as I got a greater clarity from ChatGPT, I wanted the top two files that it felt would, and I know the word felt, but that um, it could respond with would be the best candidates. And it said, plain text is number one, followed by JSON encoded uh, information. Now, granted, the majority of the information that I have is in PDF form. And I wasn't about to rewrite uh, by hand all the information in the PDFs. I could use a tool such as um, PDF to text that would extract all the text out of the PDFs, but that could actually backfire because the text would be in a format that is not really uh, usable. I also wanted to make sure that the source code from my most recent C++ project made sense 
to the AI uh, language model. And I had to go back and um, put metadata with different file groups to ensure that the AI understood what was going on with this. And so that's what I ended up doing with the um, user interface, right? So I have user interfaces um, that I wrote in C++, and I wanted to have a model, a, I wanted to have a, a blueprint of a user interface. I also had back-end code uh, libraries that I wanted it to understand as well. And so these are the final set of files, the 11 files that I came up with. I have the overall context, C++ skill context, right? That's the overall conversation and text format. So that would be unambiguous and the easiest for the AI assistant to um, digest. And then I have the knowledge base. And in that knowledge base, I also have the source code merged in to one of those PDFs. At the same time, I have um, the build process. I have the process for validating C++ code. I have the process for writing user interfaces in C++ on Linux using GTK or GTK-MM with an emphasis on the latter. I have information about editors. So if it is telling me to do code uh, on the command line, if I ask it about it, it would also have um, good knowledge, accurate and relevant knowledge about those editors in case I had some questions about that. I wanted to make it as self-sufficient and self-reliant self as possible to minimize the, um, the, the amount of, of uh, effort it would have to extend to go out to the general internet to find information related to a query that I posed to it. So I am very pleased with the, the uh, body of knowledge that I organized here, and it is just a start. There are absolutely better ways to do this, 100%. But in terms of like a, a first initial start, I think this was a, a, a good, um, wholesome, and... Um, and, and substantive start to this process. I also threw in some information about virtual machines because if you're going to do software development on your local machine, virtual machines and containers can be useful to that. And in that process, you're setting up SSH in some cases between the host and the guest. And so that information is encoded how to package RPMs and dev files with an emphasis on the latter because my emphasis is Debian, Linux, C++ development, keeping it all very narrow. And I took all of this and, you know, and this is the source code, by the way, for the main application that I wanted it to use as a template for how to build a program um, scaffold for an overall desktop application, which can also apply for command line applications as well. And I couldn't be more pleased with the results when it all was said and done, and I got those 11 files uploaded, and I tested it, and I said, you know, this is definitely a more streamlined, productive, and automated way to do um, software development, and in this case, C++ software development, in a higher quality way with um, a higher level of sensitivity to building software code the right way. And so that is the art and perspective that I wanted to encode into this process. And that's what all this represents, is that that gradual migration from a, a voluminous set of information in terms of the number of files and, um, you know, weeding that down or, or you know, aggregating that in a way that um, works. And there, um, therein lies uh, some of the challenges is that, you know, I ended up having to tweak the organization here. 
you know, some of this you, you think about library science and, uh, you know, information architecture. And in terms of building a C++ project, the build process where you convert the source code to an executable, many of these documents here relate to that. But some of these documents, while is related, they're not uh, they're they're not as uh, sp- they're they're not the most relevant in terms of actual translation. Some of that that you saw was profiling, performance profiling. Um, it's the same with graphical user interfaces as well. You know, you you could end up with a tangle between GTK three and GTK MM, and you need to make sure that you. Um, you tag the information in a way where it makes sense, right? You'll see the GNU Bash manual because, you know, when you're using VI or you're using Emacs, you know, you're using it in a shell environment and you're doing so in a way where you may have to enter shell commands. And then when it comes to um, what we would call a mindset, what kind of standards that we embrace, you know, the C++ core guidelines. You have the MISRA standards that help you with memory safety and writing code that um, doesn't go so far that it um, is unstable, but you want actual, robust, reliable, rock-solid code that you put into production. And so you want influences like that in an actual, high-quality, seasoned, well-reasoned C++ implementation when you are building an application. And so that is um, some of the things that I wanted to put together, some of the things that I wanted to emphasize. And, you know, whatever is missing from this process, you know, I feel comfortable with, um, you know, working that into the results a post generation, post recommendation from this AI assistant. But I wanted to, again, narrow the range of issues that had to be addressed. And I wanted to narrow the, the focus so that it's easier to work with and ponder. So that was the process of getting all the information together and finally getting the AI to a point where it's useful and it reflects what I want want it to do. And so there are some questions that will inevitably come up looking at this example. Let me see if I can guess some of the questions and answer them ahead of time. So question number one will be, how is this different from GitHub Copilot? There are a couple of ways this is different from GitHub Copilot. Number one, GitHub Copilot is directly integrated into your coding editor. So when you're sitting there typing code, GitHub Copilot is right there instructing you or giving you advice or suggestions on how you could write that code better and it's doing it in real time. If you are a senior software developer of a certain caliber, you will readily admit in most cases, if privately, that GitHub Copilot suggestions rank far below that which you would actually develop yourself. So the presence of a GitHub Copilot inside Visual Studio or code editors of its of, of, of similar make can be distracting and annoying to real senior developers. Not all senior developers, some would accept it. But I, would, I wouldn't find GitHub Copilot very productive for me personally. I have never used GitHub Copilot, but I've used its predecessor, which, okay, I'm stretching here, but we could say Microsoft IntelliSense is pretty much the idea that you have with GitHub Copilot. 
where as you're typing code and you have statement completion, GitHub Copilot is statement completion on steroids, right? So if you've watched some of my earlier videos from 2019, you'll see a process of software development that does not use statement completion. You're writing code straight from memory. You're using a plain text editor or the command line. And I'm not saying that that is the end all be all way to write software, but it is a way of writing software that for some provides greater flow. Your train of thought, it just comes right out from your mind onto the keyboard and you're able to navigate your code's uh, structure and hierarchy in a way that aligns with the model of the code that you have in your mind. And GitHub Copilot is a great idea and it's particularly useful, I think, for junior developers. But it is not the type of tool that applies in all situations. And it particularly does not apply in situations where what you are crafting or what you are um, producing is um, quite outside the realm of what GitHub Copilot has been trained on. I know it has access to GitHub as a whole, right? There are tens of millions of lines of code on GitHub, including my own code is on GitHub. But there's a difference between the existence of code and the true understanding of that code in relation to a particular application of that code and in a particular industry and what we would call a knowledge domain. You need to be a subject matter expert in a knowledge domain in an industry and in a overall practice. So if you're, if you're building software for logistics and supply chain, you as a software developer, you are gonna do much better if you actually understand logistics and supply chain. If you're building software to replace salespeople, it's better if you understand sales, not just the Hollywood version of it, but you understand it as a practice, a process, how it's measured, how it's executed, how it's managed in the real world, in the business world. And I could go on and on and on. So GitHub Copilot does not nominally apply in those situations. And if we're talking about building technology, so let's say it's not, you're not talking about an actual industry like hotels, automotive, and that sort of thing, but you're saying, okay, I'm building servers, I'm building office suites, I'm building photo editors, I'm building creative tools, and I'm using technology to build that. Well, there again, you still have to be an expert and you can't just take stack overflow snippets and expect those stack overflow snippets to be relevant either in whole or in a significant part to what you're doing. Have I used stack overflow in my history? Just a little bit. And I've rarely used it verbatim and I would always discipline myself to just look at the Stack Overflow suggestion and not type it out on the keyboard because I knew that wasn't the right way uh, to begin with. So it was more like, okay, what are they really getting at with this recommendation on Stack Overflow? Okay, but my actual software solution does this and it doesn't apply 100%. What is the underlying root understanding that led to this recommendational stack overflow and once you reach the root understanding of the recommendation then you're able to re-engage api documentation or the tools in such a way where you can more productively apply suggestions that you might find on the internet or elsewhere that was a long number one so again the question was how is this different from GitHub Copilot? The process that I've been showing you. The other way that it's different is that when you use a AI 
the way that it's presented in ChatGPT, it's a conversation. And in this conversation, it's giving you feedback in written form and also in some cases visual form. It's giving you feedback. So you may ask it to say, chart me out a an architecture or a software that is, let's say, I'm going to use a very trite and very common example. I want to build a to-do app. I want to build a to-do application and I want it written in Java and I want it to use the JWT framework and I want it to use next generation graphics. I want I want it to be a game of gamified desktop application in Java using J JWT. How can I go about that? And then ChatGPT is going to list out how you can go about that. And then you say, okay, cool. Now build me the actual initial software that this how this would look like in Java using JWT with the requirements that we've discussed. Now, ChatGPT will do that today. But there will always be a wrinkle in it to such an extent where you probably will end up spending hours hours if not days trying to uh, correct for what it had put together. And so, but when it works well, you're basically able to start from a, a template faster than you would building through GitHub Copilot because GitHub Copilot goes piece by piece. Now, there are some automations where you can use GitHub Copilot and it's going to generate a much um, a broader boilerplate for you. And so there's some similarities there, but with ChatGPT, you can get a level of refinement in your end result where you haven't committed to software code yet. And so that's oftentimes a much more streamlined process than having the code editor up. So in other words, ChatGPT, in many ways, is more for managers, people with a more of a tech lead manager mentality when writing software, than it is for, uh, for those that want to just jump into the writing of the software. So I'm more of the latter. I like to architect design my software before I actually put it in place. I like to know all the different components, subsystems, themes, dependencies, interconnections. I like to run the entire model through my mind before I commit to it, ideally. And ChatGPT is a great potential solution for that. So the other question would be is that why not build the software yourself and just use ChatGPT without going through this process? Why not just build the software yourself and only use ChatGPT when you need to? Well, that is actually a good point, and that is my default mode of operation. I fully support that. However, I presently work on average between 12 noon and 9 p.m. That's, that's usually the range in which I work. And when I want to do projects after hours, most evenings I am too tired to go through an, a, a full-on software development process. And so one of the advantages of having a solution like this is that it alleviates some of the effort that someone that is doing software development as a secondary activity, but who has expertise of a deep level in software development to be able to make progress on their projects without necessarily having to summon the late night motivation to uh, be as an elite as much of an elite coder or programmer or engineer as they would be during the daytime, fresh 
uh, fresh early in the day after they woke up, right? And so that's one of the advantages that a process like this offers. The other question would be is, How do you know what data to feed into this process? Well, there again is the real clue about large language models. Therein is the real secret on why AI really isn't going to replace certain levels of work and certain types of work. Because you see, in order to use a large language model better than someone else who's using a large language model. So here's the classic example. I got a person with two years of experience, maybe six months to two years of experience. I got a person with 40 years of experience, 40 years of experience, okay? So I got six to two months, 30 to 40, all right? The, the classic example in large language models in AI is that if I can give the person that's six, six, six months to two years of experience these tools, they can make work equivalent to that produced by someone with 30 to 40. That's either explicitly stated or it's implied. But the truth and the reality is, is that the person with six months to two years, they are not going to know when the large language model has given them an answer that's incorrect. They won't know well until after, until well after they have implemented it, tested it, and then you end up with another situation like you had with CrowdStrike in July 2024. And so that is the major issue that looms large with assuming that just because it's AI, it levels what you call the playing field, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is this. Person with six months to two years that uses the large language model, let's say it's a really good large language model. Let's say they're using a better version of AI than what you what you have by default today. And a person that's 30 to 40 doesn't use AI at all and they really haven't studied, they just rest on their experience. And that's fine for them. Their skills are still valuable. But the person with six months to two, two years has an advantage. We, we all agree. I think we would all agree. But the field does not stay leveled once the 30 to 40 years of experience individuals start using large language models. Then you're back to square one. Then you're back to square one. And those companies that can employ those individuals and equip them with large language models and benefit from their expertise, they're gonna have a decided advantage over those companies that save costs with those six months to two years who has a good tool and they may be able to put out results quickly but the results that are produced here they're also done quickly but they have a much higher level of quality reliability and depth and breadth of capability and that's been true throughout the history of humanity and so that's the truth of large language models is that you have to have knowledge and you have to have expertise or rather it's a mirror of the expertise that you have in some ways. Okay, not, it, not entirely. I mean, it doesn't really know what you know. And it doesn't know what the most elite people know who haven't shared their information on the internet. So when I build this custom GPT and this custom AI, that expertise that I have, to the extent that I'm able to put it in writing, I'm able to document it, to the extent that I'm able to frame it in just the right way, then I have a tool 
that for me allows me to do the things that I want to do better in a much more streamlined way than someone who tries to do things like me and who may use GPT but they don't have the accelerated expertise or they don't have the expertise in an accelerated way that I now have access to. So those are some of the questions that I can imagine. There may be more. Share them in the comment section. And I hope you liked this discussion and it was valuable to you. This is a vlog. This is a video log, a documentation of my process at this point in time in my life. And I just thought I'd take some time to put a little bit of more uh, polish on it and talk about it in a much more deliberate way. So if you have any questions, let me know. Please like the video if you think this was uh, substantive. And I will catch you on the next one.